Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dominic Gray, Head of Communication at Cernova. With me this morning is President and CEO of Cernova. We are pleased to host a conference call this morning at this important juncture in Cernova's history following the announcement of positive preliminary data in the U.S. Phase 1-2 clinical trial. We have released earlier this morning the accompanying presentation call. Presentation will be available on Cernova's website at www.cernova.com. Dr. Kalekis will first go over the presentation, including preliminary data, and will then answer questions submitted by participants email. For the purpose of this call, the conference call will be in lecture mode to allow Dr. Kalekis to talk without any interruption. We will then proceed with the question as early as we Thank you very much, Dominic, and welcome everyone to the call. Uh, we're very excited to be presenting Novanist successes at this particular juncture. I ask everyone at this particular time to start uh, reviewing the presentation, and I will go through the slides. First of all, I would like to remind everyone of the forward-looking statements um, that we have in the presentation. and. Uh, we abide by those uh, forward-looking statements. If we go on to the next slide, uh, just to discuss our mission. Uh, Cernova, again, is a clinical stage regenerative medicine therapeutics company, and we have been developing the self-house implantable device uh, with therapeutic cells. And our primary focus at this point in time is development of treatments for patients with insulin-dependent diabetes, which is a blood disorder, and thyroid. Importantly, and what we'll be talking about today as a focus, is that, is that Cernovus 2 clinical trial targeting an indication of high-risk type 1 diabetic subjects, unmet need that is called hypoglycemia and awareness as a first approach in our, for our therapeutic cell pouch technologies. With respect to the Cernova share structure, um, we have a common shares outstanding of approximately 172 million shares. Our current stock price is 22 cents, which gives us a market cap of approximately 38 million uh, Canadian dollars. And our 52 week range in price is approximately 14.5 cents to 27 cents. Our transfer agent is AST Trust Company. We are listed on the Toronto Venture Exchange on the OTCQB in the United States and on the FSH um, in German time. With respect to our management team, uh, we have a number of um, members of the management team, including our head of our president and CEO, myself, uh, Sean Hoskins, who is our CFO. Our board of directors are, is a group of individuals who are very, very experienced in this field. Uh, a number of them with successes in companies, uh, developing companies to multi-billion dollar um, valuations. And this includes Frank Huller is our chairman, Jeffrey Bacha, James Parsons, Deborah Brown, and myself on board. With respect to Cernova's approach in the regenerative medicine field, we are working on a total regenerative medicine solution for therapeutic treatment of chronic diseases. And in order to be able to do this, there are three parts of our technology that are really important. The first one is the cell pouch technology. Typically, the cell pouch is a small implantable medical device that is built on the approach of a scaffold. And what we're trying to do here is create, use the scaffold to be able to create an organ-like environment for the placement of therapeutic cells. And our approach from the place the cell pouch deep under the skin and then have the body naturally fill in the cell pouch with highly vascularized tissue. That vascularized tissue then allow us to have um, tissue chambers into which we can put therapeutic cells. Our approach is that the therapeutic cells will then connect up to the blood supply and then we'll be able to, in the case of insulin-dependent diabetes, be able to read blood sugar levels and release insulin into the bloodstream. So we believe that we have a device 
that is able to really mimic an organic environment, which is really key for these kinds of technologies. So we've gotten a very good understanding of how islets, um, which control blood sugar levels in your pancreas, are uh, are surviving in the pancreas, and we've made our cell pouch technologies to be able to mimic that approach. With respect to therapeutic cells, we first typically will work with human donor type cells. So with the islet program that we have right now, we're working with human donor islets. And that's very exciting to us because we already know that the islets in your own body function properly to control your blood sugar levels. So if we put these functional islets within the cell pouch, that gives us a really good way to be able to test out the cell pouch in our patients and using the real thing that is actually in your own body. Then as we're moving forward, we all know that there is only a limited supply of donor cells, and so we are also developing stem cell-derived technologies. And those stem cell-derived technologies are able to treat virtually all diabetic patients. So we can essentially make the number of cells that are required to treat as many patients as we need going forward. So we have applications for diabetes, uh, whereby we're starting with human donor cells and then moving forward with our stem cell technologies. We are working also on hemophilia A, which is a bleeding disorder where the patient of factor eight. And we have developed a technology whereby we can take a sample of the patient's own blood, correct that for, for producing uh, factor eight, put those cells in our cell pouch, for example, and have those release the factor into the bloodstream that is required to treat these uh, patients. And then we're also working in the thyroid disease area where we can take patients whose thyroid gland has been removed and we're working to attempt to recover the function of the thyroid gland for these patients. So you can see that we have a number of different therapeutic applications doing, using different cell types. With respect to immune protection of those cells, um, if we're using your own cells in the body, there's no need to do immune protection. But if there are donor cells going into uh, the application of the cell pouch, then we can protect those with immune protection medications that are already um, out and approved in the market. And also we're working on local immune protection within the cell pouch of the cells that can eliminate the need for such medications. So if you think about it, we have all three parts of the technologies that are required to be able to do regenerative medicine approach for multiple therapeutic applications. So if we move on and have a look at our pipeline, currently we are very focused on our clinical trial at, at the University of Chicago. And here we're focused on working with human donor islets um, within, within the cell pouch in patients that have severe hypoglycemia unawareness. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And here these patients are provided immune protection medications. As we're moving forward to our pipeline, at the same time, we're working on technologies to eliminate the niche drugs so that we can have a treatment for patients that do not require any immune protection medications. And then as we're moving forward, we're also working on our uh, licensed uh, stem cell derived technologies um, with the microencapsulated cells to be able to treat um, all patients that have type 1 diabetes. With respect to our hemophilia program, we have been working through the Horizon 2020 program whereby the company and its um, academic investigators in Europe have received a 5.6 million euro grant, and this is non-dilutive funding, to be able to develop a product for the hemophilia patients. And I'll talk a little bit more about what our successes have been in that program over the past couple of years. Then again, similar to what we're doing in diabetes, we're working on an allograft immune protected cell that we, whereby we can treat all uh, hemophilia A. Our next indication, again, is thyroid, uh, thyroid replacement. <clears throat> and I will talk about this um, as we're moving forward. But our main focus is on the type 1 diabetic uh, clinical trial. So I'll now move on and talk about our experiences with our human clinical evaluation of the cell pouch in patients. So if we go to the next slide, we can see that we have been focusing on patients that have severe hypoglycemia unawareness. 
and this affects approximately 10% of type 1 diabetic patients, or approximately 125,000 patients in the U.S. So what is hypoglycemia unawareness? And the way I put this is that these are people who, when they take an insulin injection, are not aware of their blood sugar levels dropping to very, very dangerous low levels. So in other words, most of us, when, when we are not eating food, we get shakes and tremors and this kind of thing, and it makes us aware that we need to eat something. And these particular individuals, they don't have that regulatory mechanism, and their blood sugar levels can drop all the way to a very dangerous level, and they can actually go unconscious without even knowing it. So this is, this is very, very severe and something that is a major unmet need. This is something that we can help correct, uh, correct with the cell pouch and uh, therapeutic cells. So, as everyone probably knows, we have conducted a first in human study in Canada. Um, we spent years and years validating our technologies in small and large animal models, and we were able to show that we could make these animals insulin independent. So we were able to even take the human clinical device and put it in large animal models of diabetes, and we were successful at treating diabetes in these animals, which is really important. So once we put our regulatory documentation together, we got cleared by Health Canada to conduct a small study, and we were looking at um, putting these, uh, inserting these, uh, these devices in diabetic patients and then putting the therapeutic cells within a device, and the first thing we needed to do is look at safety of the device and to see if these cells were actually surviving within the device, because that's a major accomplishment to be able to show that. So what we, what we did is that, first of all, we successfully showed that the cell house implanted under the skin was safe in the patients that we work with, and then over a period of time, approximately 30 days, we removed pouches from patients, and then we had them assessed independently by a blinded physician, pathologist. And very, very excitingly, what they found out is that the islets that they found were housed within a natural tissue matrix within the chambers of the cell pouch. The islets were very, very well vascularized. In other words, blood vessels came in and kept those islets alive and enabled those islets to be able to uh, read blood sugar levels, essentially. Um, the islets also showed evidence of being able to produce insulin, somatostatin, and glucagon, which are three key, key hormones in controlling blood sugar levels. And of course, we were able to show that the cell pouch and islet uh, biocompatibility was met. Interestingly, we also showed that the islets with our uh, immune protection medications were protected from immune system attacks. So these are really important findings. So to give you an idea, uh, within the cell pouch, the next slide shows in red, stain for insulin, human islets within one of the chambers of the cell pouch. See that these islets have, are surviving, and the green actually indicates small blood vessels that are actually going right to the, the center of, of the islet, which is exactly what you have in your pancreas. So this showed that not only small animals and large animals, but also in humans for the first time ever, that a device that is vascularized can help islets, enable islets to be able to survive, proven that these islets are able to produce all of the regulatory hormones to control blood sugar levels. This is a very, very important finding for us. We then started to work with an investigator at the University of Chicago, and we developed a clinical protocol that is the current clinical protocol we're working on. We then applied to Juvenile Diabetes Association in New York, and our study was reviewed extensively, and then we received a significant uh, grant to help fund this particular program. So again, another non-dilutive grant to, su to support our company and our clinical program. And we're very, very pleased that the Juvenile Diabetes Association is supporting our, our work. So what is this study about? And why are we excited about it? So the study is called Safety, Tolerability, and Efficacy Study of Cernova Cell Pouch for Clinical Islet Transplantation. 
The study is an open-label, single-arm study of Synova cell pouch implanted with eyelids. And the eyelids are transplanted into the cell pouch after we implant the cell pouch, and then we get the patients to be stabilized on their anti-rejection uh, medications. So open-label basically means that the results are coming in, and as the physician and the company feels that we have achieved significant results, we can actually release some of those results uh, in the public way, which is what we have done. The primary objective is to demonstrate safety and tolerability of the cell pouch and the eyelid transplantation within the cell pouch. And interestingly, our secondary objectives are to really start to understand how the cell pouch and the eyelids are functioning in the body and what they're actually doing to control blood sugar levels and how they're working. So we have three secondary objectives that we're looking at. And the first one is survival of um, endocrine tissue within the cell pouch. So in other words, we are off in our first study, and now we're again looking at that in the second study as the secondary objective. And the second one is the proportion of subjects with a reduction in severe hypoglycemic events. So we're really trying to see if we can help these patients reduce the number of uh, low levels of blood sugar levels that can occur um, when insulin is injected. The next one is looking at the proportion of patients with a, with a reduction in HbA1c, and HbA1c is an indicator of longer-term control of blood sugar levels in your body, and these are all standard measures that are done in diabetic patients. Interestingly, we also have 20 additional endpoint analyses that we're looking at that are all around the blood sugar control and how these patients are being affected by our cell pouch and eyelids. So um, we are also working with a, a contract research group uh, called CTI, and we have a large team of very, very experienced uh, individuals in clinical trials working to support Cernova in um, moving forward with this clinical trial. So this is, we are working with a very top-notch team for internally as well as externally. We've obviously cleared by FDA in our institutional review board, and very importantly, we're also Medtronic has supplied continuous glucose monitoring systems for our patients so that we can look on, on a 24-hour basis what our patients are doing in terms of glucose control and how that's working. So this is a very important advancement in terms of getting a really good understanding of what's going on with our cell pouch and our therapeutic cells. So if we can go on to slide 14, it talks about the phase one, two uh, timeline. So the way this study works is that we will implant the cell pouch, and as I mentioned earlier, it takes approximately three to four weeks, weeks for the cell pouch to fill in with the vascularized tissue to create these beautifully lined um, pouches or chambers for putting the therapeutic cells in. We then allow the patients to get stabilized in their immune protection medications so that they're all fine from that perspective, and then we put them on the transplant list. And typically people think, well, if you're having a heart transplant, it'll take five years to get a new heart. But here, uh, there are available organs very rapidly uh, for us. So our patient was able to be transplanted with first dose of islets within a couple of days after being put on the transplant list. So this is very, very exciting. At the 90-day time point, the sentinel pouch is removed. So again, we put a small device in there that has a few therapeutic cells, and we can take that device out and have a look at those cells to see if they're surviving. We did this in the previous study, and we found surviving cells, as I mentioned earlier. Then we do safety studies, safety measurements all along, and then we measure efficacy in those multiple points, as we had discussed. At the six-month period, at this point in time, we make a decision with uh, a series of efficacy measures about whether we want to put a second dose of violets into the device, and then we follow that patient along. So what's really exciting about this study is that there are an enormous number of learnings that we're getting out of this that is up our program forward. So we're not only able to see the effect of a single dose of violets, but also what happens when we put a second dose of violets into these patients as we're moving forward. And we have devices that are placed in the patients that are already ready 
for implantation of the second uh, transplant. So this is, I consider this, and, and our company consider this as long as with our physician, a very, very exciting study and a real contribution to the field. So um, what was decided, and I think everyone knows this, is that our, our surgeon was invited to present the uh, clinical study at the International Islet Transplant Conference that occurred a couple of weeks ago, and this conference occurs once every two years. So it was decided that he would have a look at some of the data, and at first we decided that we would present the safety information uh, about how things were going, but <clears throat> very excitingly, we also started to see some indicators of blood sugar control in different ways in this patient. So it was decided to accumulate those data at the conference. So um, in that regard, we, we decided that we would take the very first patient that was treated because this patient is the furthest along in the study of all the patients and let the world know on what we have seen so far. And what is exciting to me about this is that it's very rare to get um, an early look at what's going on with the clinical trial. Typically, you have to wait till the very end of the trial to find out whether it's working or not, and we're getting a glimpse of what's happening in the first treated patient, and we're pretty proud of the results so far. So I will go over those. So as I said, the primary endpoint is safety. So is the product safe in this patient? And what we're looking at is the incidence and severity of adverse events determined to be probable or highly probable uh, to the cell path. So we have very, very clear wording that we have to use with respect to FDA. And what we found is that there were no in incidents of adverse events determined to be probable or highly probable to the cell path. We found that the cell path was well tolerated and safe during the implant and at the time of transplant. We had no reactions to the cell pouch implant, so there were no inflammatory reactions, no issues with respect to the cell pouch implant. And importantly, when the surgeon went in to look at the cell pouch in, in placing the therapeutic cells, he was excited to find that the cell pouch was very well incorporated with vascularized tissue and suitable to receive the eyelid transplant. So this is very, very encouraging and very, very positive. And in that regard, officially, we were able to say that the interim safety data meets the first measure of the primary endpoint. So what that means is that we have multiple times that we follow uh, safety in these patients, and we will continue to report on safety as we're moving forward. So with respect to secondary objectives and endpoints, we're looking at establishing the islet release criteria that accurately characterizes the islet product. So is the, you know, looking at the islets that are placed in the device and also are predictable, are predictive of clinical transplant outcomes in the cell pouch, which, will, which are demonstrated through very clearly defined measures of efficacy. And I've already gone over these before, so I won't go over them again. So let's just have a look at some of the results that have been presented. So in this first, uh, patients, in terms of some initial efficacy results, we found that the patient had um, a reduction in uh, body weight from that perspective. And if we look at this, first of all, we're looking at the pre-transplant uh, results, and then we're looking at results three months after the eyelids have been transplanted into this patient. So that's the 90-day time point. We found that the hemoglobin A1C started out at 6.5, and this 6.5 number is a number that can only be achieved, and that's the minimum level that you can typically get with just insulin injections by itself. And our patient at the three-month period has um, gotten those, a number to reduce to 5.6, and that number is staying stable, which is very, very encouraging. It doesn't look like a big number change, but this is considered an important change uh, for this for this, in this, in these particular patients. The daily use of long-acting insulin went from 14 units to eight units a day. So that will be considered quite a reduction in the use of insulin and the need for insulin. 
And the short-acting insulin that is used daily was also reduced somewhat. What is really important is that the severe hypoglycemic events were reduced in this patient. And at the uh, baseline, we were finding approximately six to nine severe hypoglycemic events in a three-month period. With cell pouch and eyeless, there was one over the three-month period. So if you imagine being a, being a patient that has high, severe hypoglycemia unawareness, to have six to nine times a month where you are at a severe risk of passing out and not recovering, that is now down to one every three months. And that's with our first dose of cells in our first patient. So we're pretty excited about these results. On the right-hand side, standard tests that are done in patients that have uh, type 1 diabetes are something called a glucose tolerance test. And here the patient is given a high sugar drink, and then we look at the blood sugar levels, we measure the gold standard C-peptide in the bloodstream, and also what the insulin response is that is measured over a number of hours. So if you imagine when you drink um, a high sugar dr drink, the sugar will go to the islets, the islets will produce um, insulin, and C-peptide is the gold standard measure that insulin is being produced because it's produced at the same time. And then that insulin goes into your bloodstream, and then it allows the gates of your cells to open up and absorb that insulin, that sugar, that blood sugar law. So what did we find? We showed that there was some increase in the levels of C-peptide in the blood. So this is really important because the body previous to the cell pouch implant was not producing any C-peptide. So that C-peptide had to come from the islets in the cell pouch. Also shown were increases in blood levels of insulin, difficult insulin response. So what was happening there is that what we're looking at is that the islets from the cell pouch are responding to the blood sugar levels and releasing insulin into the bloodstream. So as we can see, this is definitive proof that the cell pouch islets are surviving in the cell pouch and able to respond to high levels of sugar by releasing insulin into the bloodstream. This is initially being shown in our first patient and very exciting that uh, we're starting to see these measures of blood sugar control in, uh, with our study. The next slide gives us an example of the continuous glucose monitoring system that was in the patient. And what was found here is that the glucose monitors were inserted in the patients at baseline for 14 days, which is a standard procedure that they will like in for 14 days and follow the, those patients, that patient for 24 hours a day. And then we compared at various uh, time points throughout the study post-transplant of the islets. We then, and this uh, glucose monitoring system is blind to the patient, so the patient doesn't know what was going on. So what we did in the studies, we had our team at Medtronic take the device uh, and then analyze the result, results to us. So what they found is that there were improvement in all glucose parameters seen post-transplant in this individual. And importantly, what we're asking, the question, the question that we're asking here is that is the high level of blood sugar level in this patient's blood reduced over time with cell pouch, and are the lows that the patient experiences increased? And so we're looking at is there, is there an improved stabilization of blood sugar levels during that two-week period? And if we can stabilize the blood sugar levels during that two-week period, then that shows an improvement with the cell pouch and iris device. So very briefly, we showed that baseline, um, the highest glucose value was 285 milligram per deciliter, and that was dropped to 231 with cell pouch transplant. Um, the low levels were went down to 50, and our lows went, went were raised to 66. The number of excursions, in other words, time when it, the uh, blood sugar levels were outside the range that we want them to be, were 15 during that two-week period and only three with, with cell pouch. And if we go down uh, to the low excursions, 
there were eight during that two-week period, so these are the hypo events, and only one with the cell pouch. So every measure was improved. The next, if you look at the bottom at baseline CGM, you can see on the left-hand side that in the control period, the patient was 12% of their time in the danger zone. It was down to 1%. So that would be considered um, a real improvement in this patient. So what is interesting is that we take multiple measures of blood sugar in terms of how we look at control and this kind of thing, and what we're seeing in this individual in all of those areas. So if we look at the summary, what we found is that with cell pouch and eyelids, relative to the baseline, we showed a 90-day improvement in hemoglobin A1C, a 90-day reduction in long-acting use of insulin, and in our continuous glucose monitor assessment, we showed improvement in all glucose control parameters that was measured by continuous glucose monitoring. We showed a reduction in severe hypoglycemic events. We showed 87.5% reduction in overall hypoglycemic events relative to control. And the time below 70 milligrams per deciliter in blood sugar was 12% in, in the control versus a reduction down to 1% over that two-week time frame with the cell pouches and the eyelids. Importantly, also, at the 90-day glucose tolerance test time, we showed a typical insulin release curve when the patient was given a high glucose drink. And then we also demonstrated for the first time C-peptide blood levels. So our conclusion with this individual patient is that the cell pouch with eyelids, the eyelids are surviving in the cell pouch. They're able to respond to a blood sugar level. They're able to produce insulin in the bloodstream, able to produce C-peptide, and able to stabilize blood sugar levels. So these results are in one patient, of course, our first patient, but what is exciting is that uh, when you're looking at a medical device, you, you want to make sure, first of all, does this medical device work? And if you can show that it works even in one patient, then what we need to do is then start to replicate that. If you show in the device that your, cell, your device fibrosed and all the cells died, then that's, even in one patient, you're showing that that device doesn't work, and you've got to go back to the drawing board. So very importantly to us, we showed that our device technology, whereby we're creating these tissue line vascularized tissue chambers, actually works, and that the islets and the cells we're putting there are surviving, and that they are able to respond to a glucose load. So it is the first patient, we have a lot more data that's going to be coming out, not only in this patient over time, but also in additional patients as, that are being enrolled in the study and moving forward. So th this one patient has given the physician confidence to believe working and to continue on with the study and to move forward with uh, additional patients in the study. And you will be seeing data coming out over, over the next while. So future developments and additional programs. First of all, I wanted to mention that on um, local immune protection of our cell pouch and our stem cell technologies in different ways to be able to treat all patients with diabetes. Secondly, with respect to our hemophilia program, I wanted to reinforce that the company and theaters under the Horizon 2020 program received a 5.6 million euro non-dilutive grant and develop a product through preclinical success over the past three years. And if you look at hemophilia A, there are approximately 20,000 patients. So this is an orphan site indication, and it's approximately 10 to $15 billion a year that is being spent on these patients. The typical patient has to infuse doses of factor eight three times a week, 
to be able to get levels in their blood sufficient so that they have clotting. And this is at a cost of approximately $200,000 a year. Um, currently, these patients are given uh, gene correct. And so what we're working on is we, as I said before, we are taking a dose, we have been able to take a dose of blood from the patient, isolate a certain cell type, correct that cell type so that those cells are now producing factor eight. We can scale up or multiply those cells. We've shown that we've been able to take those cells and ship them from Europe to Canada. We've then been able to put those cells into our device in a preclinical model of hemophilia. And we've been able to show that we've been able to recover the function of clotting in our preclinical models. And this is a very concept because we're working with actual real human tissue that is going into our animal models of hemophilia. This program is advancing forward, and we were very, very pleased to be able to receive the Horizon 2020 grant from the European Union with our academic investigators in Europe. With respect to our thyroid program, here it's estimated to be about a 2.2 billion market. There are approximately 300,000 patients a year in North America that are having their thyroid gland removed for benign purposes. And these patients have to take then thyroid medications every single day for the rest of their lives. And they typically will have to take blood samples so that we can measure the amount of thyroid uh, hormones in their blood to try to stabilize them in the same way that these patients, that diabetic patients are having to take insulin for diabetes. And if you do not have your thyroid medications, basically you can go into severe depression, a number of other issues, and you can actually die from this. So thyroid uh, medication is extremely important. So what Cernova is working on uh, with, a, with a surgeon, again, is to be able to take tissue from patients that are having their thyroid glands removed. And we can identify the safe normal tissue, and we're able to freeze that tissue, and then we've been taking that human tissue and putting it into our cell pouch within an animal model. And we've been able to show um, survival of that thyroid tissue. The tissue becomes highly vascularized within the cell pouch, and we're even able to measure blood levels of critical hormones that are being produced. So this is an indication that is coming along, and I believe we are the first company in the entire world that is producing, um, that has a uh, cell therapy program for thyroid disease. So we look forward to more information coming out about that program also. So as we're moving forward, I just wanted to talk about some of our collaborators, and we're thrilled to be working with JDRF, who has been an incredible support to the company and our technologies. We have gotten um, um, immunoprotection medications for our preclinical studies over time from Novartis. We have been working with the National Research Council of Canada, and we received our first grant, our first grant of $500,000 from the National Research Council when, we, when I first came on board to start our first autograph study, so we're really, really pleased with the work the Government of Canada has provided to us to enable our technologies to get to the point where they are. We've been working with the London Health Science Centre at um, Western Ontario University. We have been working with um, the, the Canadian Centre for Regenerative Medicine at, in Toronto uh, in terms of developing stem cell technologies, etc. And we're also working with others in terms of uh, developing stem cell programs with respect to our uh, cell pouch. And we have been uh, receiving grants for our, uh, some of our students from the MITAX group. So at this point in time, um, I would like to conclude the presentation and move on to the question and answer period. And I thank everyone for uh, listening to this presentation. I just want to say that, that we have been working on our technologies for over 10 years, um, and we have significant patent protection around the world. We are very, very interested in developing corporate partnerships with medical device companies and pharma companies and are being very successful from that perspective. Our technologies have a very, very high level of respect around the world through 
um, various investigators and our corporate partners. And we're really, really pleased with um, all of our investors who have supported us throughout the years. Thank you very much, Dr. Delinkus, for this great presentation. Uh, we've received numerous questions from participants, and we'd like to thank participants for their engagement. In the company presentation, there are two big studies discussed, an autograph and an allograph study. I assume the autograph study did not require immune protection medication, but the allograph study did. The autograph study appeared to occur for a longer time, and the allograph study was shorter. Were the pigs in each group insulin independent, and were the graphs still functioning when the pig studies were completed? Thank you very much for that question. So first of all, the autograph study, so auto means self, and that involved the removal of the pancreas from the animals. And then our team is expert at isolating islets and have been doing this for many, many years from the pancreas. And the pig cell cells were transplanted into the cell pouch. So in other words, if you can imagine, we removed the pancreas from the animals, the surgical procedure, and we were able to isolate the islets from the, the cell pouch and place them into the device. And this mimics a therapy that involves patients that have pancreatectomy, where they have pancreatitis and severe pain in their pancreas and removal of the, cell, of the pancreas, and then we would be able to isolate those islets and put them into the cell pouch. So we were mimicking this indication. And this resulted in our cell pouch getting long-term survival of the islets and insulin independence in these animals. So we are able to show that if we take the animal's own islets and put them into the device without any immune protection medications, we are able to get insulin independence long-term. With respect to the allograft study, the diabetic pigs with cell pouch and donor islets received immune protection medications specific to controlling the pig's immune response so we can protect those cells. The study was shorter than the autograph study because the goal was to demonstrate glucose control in these animals, and we achieved that very early on in the study. In each particular case, the graphs and the cell pouch was functioning right to the end of the study, and then what we did is remove the cell pouches and the cells to show that the glucose control was lost without the cell pouch in its islets. So this is a way to prove that the cell pouch is working. And in both cases, after we removed the cell pouch in the islets, the blood sugar level started to go back up again, indicating definitively that cell pouch is working. Then we took the cell pouches and we always sliced them up and we do something called histology whereby we're staining the tissues, the different tissues in the cell pouch and we have independent pathologists review those slides. And what they showed was survival of the islets and that the islets were able to produce all of the hormones that could protect, that could provide function. We also proved in the allograft study that the pancreas of the animal was completely devoid of functional islet cells, which shows that the results we were getting in this allograft study were purely due to the islets within the cell pouch. So I just want to say, uh, with respect to our preclinical studies, that we are very, very tough in terms of how we do our studies, and we validate over and over again in multiple animal models, small animals and large animal models, to be able to show um, how our device is working, and that has lended us experience in terms of our uh, clinical studies moving forward. Will the patients in the current study remain on immunosuppressive therapy as long as the islet of cells continue to function, or will they be tapered off immunosuppressive? Okay. In this particular clinical protocol, which focuses on severe hypoglycemia underwear patients, they will remain on immune protection islet transplant. However, CERNOVA, as I had mentioned, is developing methods to protect the cells located in the cell pouch without immune protection medications, which will be able to reach all patients with diabetes. So anytime currently that you put 
another type of cell from another um, individual into your into your body, it's going to be, have to be protected from immune system attack. Uh, and so that is what we're doing from the standard procedure. Your peers in this space appear to be raising a large amount of capital to do their work. Alice Cernova able to achieve the same thing or more with far less capital. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think we have been um, in essentially in a way criticized for that, but at the same time we have also been honored for that, for the work that we have done. So Cernova has been very, very cash efficient and has secured non dilutive grants for its programs. We also have extensive experience on our teams with combination products involving implantable medical devices, as well as cell biology, physiology, immunology, surgical techniques, and model development, which as a team has helped us to focus on moving our development programs forward in an efficient and correct way. Basically, we have a very, very good understanding of the biology, as well as medical devices and cell biology. And we've been able to put these together to be able to do our technologies correctly and be successful. And as a result, Cernova is now the only company in the world, we believe, that has been able to prove islet survival and function in its device, prevascularized device, in small and large models, and also now in humans. And Cernova also, importantly, chooses its collaborators who have very significant experience to be able to add to our intellectual capabilities. So um, it's really all about efficiency uh, from that perspective. Since Solberry got a on board, what interest in Cernova technologies have you seen from U.S. institutional investors, and what is your plan for the future in the U.S., which has a huge population of diabetic patients? Yeah, okay. So first of all, um, Cernova has been focused on our Canadian investors over the years because it's really Canadians who have been supporting this company uh, for a long time, and we honor our Canadian investors. And we value their investments in the company, and we value their support. We have, in the U.S., also been working with Trout and have presented to institutional investment groups who have also invested in the regenerative medicine space in, uh, for other groups, and we have been interviewed by their analysts who ask a lot of technical questions, and we've received very, very positive interest in our technologies. As the right time and the right company valuation occurs, our plans with respect to the U.S. markets is to list on the major U.S. exchange. And this will occur again at the right time, at the right company valuation. Furthermore, with respect to the U.S. market, our communication team is consistently messaging our technologies and successes into the U.S. market and to not only investors, but also to patients with diabetes. And this is not only occurring in the U.S., but occurring around the world. So we have social media applications and other ways of getting the message out. And this will continue as time goes on. And I think people can see also that with the success, even in this early uh, initial uh, program that we're working on, we have gotten a lot of media attention, which is very positive. With regards to the clinical trial and the presented data, why is Cernova referring to a two-week continuous glucose monitoring period? And what is the window that was used to establish the baseline? So this is really set by uh, Medtronic, who manufactures the continuous glucose monitoring system. And basically, what a patient wears the glucose monitoring system for approximately two weeks straight at a time. And that assesses 24-hour glucose measurements. So the standard procedure is to have the patient wear the glucose monitor for a two-week period, and then all the data is collected and analyzed. And we typically, in the study, it's done at baseline prior to cell house transplant and islet placement, and then at multiple times at defined periods throughout the study. And what this enables us to do is look at all of the uh, glucose control during those periods, 
look at the hypo, glycemic events, et cetera, at different time points in the study. So as I said before, um, we have our first measure at 90 days, but we're continuing to take measurements throughout the entire study, and uh, over time we'll present, be presenting those data. Why is there no one focusing on hypoglycemia on awareness as the first indication? So, again, as I mentioned in uh, the presentation, hypoglycemia and awareness is a significant unmet need in the population of people with type 1 diabetes whose lives can be significantly improved with our device and islets um, pending, um, you know, additional positive outcomes. In clinical research, there are also protocols established for these subjects to receive an immune protection medications, and these although are out there, require a better solution. And this has enabled us to be able to work with these patients and these protocols to be able to conduct our first uh, clinical study with cell pouch and, and human donor islets. And our approach is allowing us to help these patients as we're moving forward, hopefully, and advances our knowledge faster towards providing a product for all diabetic patients. So again, in terms of efficiency, we're thinking very, very carefully about from a strategic perspective. And by working with the real thing, which is human donor islets, we're learning everything we need to so that as our stem cell derived technologies come along, we already have learned what we need to to be able to advance those stem cell technologies in a very rapid and positive way. So one last question for you, Dr. Tomekis. Is everything on track with the University of Chicago clinical trial? And why are you so encouraged about the results of the first patient? So, yes, we, everything is on track. We have significant continuing interest from patients in the trial. As far as even yesterday, numerous patients have reached out to us as a majority of the questions we received for this conference call were with respect to participation in the study. And we forwarded these to the clinical site. We have consented a number of patients for the study from all of this interest. And this has occurred from across the United States, and we're continuing to schedule and prepare study participants for implantation and transplantation of islets, and data will be coming out over the next while from that perspective. Our clinical investigator was invited to do a presentation update of the Cernova study, as I mentioned, at the recent International Islet Transplantation Conference that is held every two years. We expected, as I mentioned earlier, to present some safety data, but again, upon reviewing the early results, the physician was excited with the information on a number of measures of glucose control, including findings of glucose-stimulated C-peptide and insulin. It was decided then that he would present this study to the world and then do a case report of the very first patient treated in the study, who is now the furthest along in the study. And these results are important in this one patient, as I mentioned previously, because it demonstrates definitively that our cell pouch can not only keep cells alive, but that the cells can react to a sugar load, providing the concept, proving the concept of the device. And we are now continuing to enroll patients to support these data. What is really important for everyone to know is that these are early data. We all admit that and understand that but we're excited and very encouraged by these early data in this first individual patient. And importantly, it gives us the excitement to be able to treat additional patients and be able to provide data as it comes out to um, both the patient community and the investors community. So um, we're, we're quite happy with the progress of the study and with how things are moving along with respect to our technology. This is indeed a very important juncture in Chernobyl's clinical trial and history. And I'd like to thank you, Dr. Delikis, for taking the time to give this presentation this morning. And I'd like to thank all the participants for their call and your engagement and your questions.